We're going to take a close look at the San Francisco Oracle, one of the most beautiful and important artifacts, the Rosetta Stone of that forgotten civilization called the Haight-Ashbury and its inhabitants, the hippies. By taking this journey, we will visit the past and also envision another possible future. One night in the spring of 1966, I had a dream of a newspaper with rainbows on it being read all over the world. When that dream entered the pool of creativity that was already forming in the hate, it turned into a wave of meetings. Ron and Jay Thelen, who had just opened the first psychedelic shop on New Year's Day, offered a few hundred dollars of starting capital. At the first meeting, two factions developed, a political faction that wanted a radical, anti-establishment, confrontational paper, and a faction of poets, artists, and visionaries who wanted to create something that would transcend the sociological trap of us and them and the political dualities of right and left, a form of expression that would advance the change of consciousness and custom that was happening in the hate. The first San Francisco Oracle was still a traditional tabloid, edited by George Sangus and John Bronson. I wrote the front page lead, reporting a community meeting at the I Thou Coffee House with a police community relations officer as guest speaker. He said that the cigarette he was smoking was probably more harmful than pot smoking. The article caused a stir and the police officer was reassigned. The back page was an announcement of the Love Pageant Rally. The first free public outside rock and roll concert on the day LSD was to become illegal by state edict, October 6th, 1966. The three sixes, 666 six, six in the date, symbolically referenced to the rising of the beast in the book of Revelations, signifying to us that the state was intruding on our internal experiences of the beatific vision. The idea for the concert developed when the visionary artist Michael Bowen and I were sitting in a coffee house watching a parade of hippies protesting a pot bust of the 1090 Page Street Commune, where Big Brother and the Holding Company first formed and performed. The procession was marching up Hate Street toward the Park Police Station, holding signs and angrily shouting, Down with Fascism! We thought that there must be a less confrontational way to voice our protests than yet another angry demonstration, leading to more arrests and reprisals. Since LSD was to be made illegal in about a month, we decided that instead of another protest, we would have a Bacchanalian celebration in the panhandle of Golden Gate Park. We asked some of the emerging bands to play, the Grateful Dead, Big Brother and the Holding Company, and the Chamber Orchestra. We held a press conference and brought flowers and mushrooms to the mayor's office. The media was enthralled and thoroughly confused. Two or three thousand people came. Ken Kesey's psychedelic bus further was there, as were the Hells Angels, who Kesey had befriended and turned on to LSD after they had attacked a peace march in Berkeley. The police looked in vain for Kesey, who had returned from Mexico and was a very wanted man. Everyone was asked to bring flowers, beads, costumes, bells, drums, and joy, and we published a new Declaration of Independence declaring, We behold these experiences to be self-evident, that the creation endows us with certain inalienable rights, that among them are the freedom of body, the pursuit of joy, and the expansion of consciousness. The Love Pageant Rally was such a success that we immediately were inspired to do it again, but on a scale that would rock the world. The lead story in Oracle 2 was about martial law being declared in San Francisco, September 1966, in the Fillmore 
Hunters Point and the Haight-Ashbury districts. In the streets, red-faced acne boys with rifles meet long-haired stone girls with long dresses. As Article 3 was being laid out, the old guard of ex-newspaper men deserted, and Gabe Katz and I designed and edited issue number three. Gabe was a dropped-out advertising artist from New York who had taken LSD and had beatific visions of Tim Leary. Ken Kesey had been busted a few months before for smoking marijuana on a San Francisco rooftop. Instead of standing trial, he jumped bail, feigned suicide, and escaped with Neil Cassidy to Mexico. But America beckoned and Ken devised a plan for his return. He would have a gigantic party like the acid tests, but tell everyone to graduate from using LSD. What is going to be the theme of your uh, meeting? It's going to be a uh, graduation ceremony and a commencement exercise, uh, essentially for the heads. And uh, other people that would like to uh, know what the heads are doing. Are you going to tell what's bad about LSD? Not necessarily. Uh, will LSD be good. in evidence uh, at the graduation ceremony, Ken? Um, why don't you guys come? <laughs> held the graduation in the spontaneously decorated Calliope Warehouse. LSD seemed to be in every hand and body. Everyone wore Halloween costumes. The first Moog synthesizer used in a rock and roll band vibrated through the mine. The Hells Angels guarded the doors, and Neil Cassidy rapped his ambiguous rhapsodies. Article 4, Lenore Candell writes about censorship and the love book. And Lee Myersoff probes the meaning of the bust of the love book and the bust in July of Michael McClure's play, The Beard, during its performance at the Committee Theater. The police and City Hall were not pleased with the brashness of this emerging and very public bohemia. The hate had its own institutions, drugs, dance halls, newspaper, customs, and a tremendous appeal to the disillusioned and alienated youth of America, and a belief in free love. The Diggers were a group of anti-materialistic political anarchists whose leadership sought anonymity in the midst of the hate spotlight. At the handle of the kettle describes the vibes at a Digger Thanksgiving. It was customary for any Digger to claim to be Emmett Grogan, their most outspoken leader. Grogan, Peter Berg, and Peter Coyote had been members of the Mind Troop. They saw the hate as a living stage and created happenings and ceremonies such as the death of money and the death of the hippie. They coordinated anarchistic street takeovers, summer solstice ceremonies, and free rock concerts. They fed hundreds of people in the panhandle every day and helped provide crash pads for America's young refugees. They opened a free store where all the merchandise was free for the taking, and asked merchants and promoters to put 1% of their profits back into the community. They published their philosophy and announcements on mimeographed broadsides and leaflets that became known as the Digger Papers. The, the Diggers had several goals. One was the immediate one, to simply act out free, put free in front of any word you could think of. 
a free phone box, free lunch, free district, of, uh, uh, district attorney, free judge, free policeman, free boy, free girl, whatever, especially free love. A uh, love being the, the word that had been uh, foisted on the hate ashbury And the long-term goal was to uh, create a, a bomb, uh, a situation in which the people that were refugees from American culture at the time and Western civilization would be able to re-see exchanges between each other. Well, the diggers didn't stand for anything, but they were about personal authenticity and taking responsibility for your own visions. The police who didn't like the police brutality story or the activity around the psychedelic shop or through love or poetry decided to bust us all at once. As a pretext, San Francisco Vice picked out the Noah Candell's Love Book, a small book of poems about the beauty and spirituality of the sexual act, using common names for our physical parts and much tantric Hindu symbolism. The trial lasted five weeks as a parade of scholars, priests, nuns, sociologists, public health officials, doctors, poets, and psychologists testified on the nature of love and poetry. I brought roses to the courtroom from Jay Felon's garden and gave them to judge, prosecutor, and jury. It was cosmic. Richard Alpert, later to be known as Ram Das, was a psychologist at Harvard who participated with Tim Leary in the early research and experimentation using LSD at Harvard and at Millbrook. In our interview, Alpert says, The Haight-Ashbury is the purest reflection of what is happening in consciousness at the leading edge in our society. This is an interesting question whether we Westerners can ever take on a master. Master roles really don't fit into Western culture. The centerfold for the BN issue was Renaissance or Die, a speech Allen Ginsberg gave in Boston, November 1966, to a convocation of Unitarian ministers. The drawing was by Rick Griffin. Ginsberg declared, how can we Americans change theme? I will make a first proposal, that everybody who hears my voice try the chemical LSD at least once, every man, woman, and child over 14 in good health. Then I prophesy we will all have seen some ray of glory or vastness beyond our conditioned social selves, beyond our government, beyond America even, that will unite us into a peaceful community. America's political need is orgies in the park on Boston Commons with naked bacantes in the national forest. I am acknowledging what is already happening among the young in fact and fantasy. I am in effect setting up moral codes and standards which include drugs, orgy, music, and primitive magic as worship rituals. And I am proposing these standards to you respectable ministers that you endorse publicly the private desire and knowledge of mankind in America so to inspire the young the parents who are concerned about your children who are being exposed to LSD and marijuana. There's no doubt about that, and there's nothing you can do about it. My advice is to sit down with your kids and ask them what they're learning, why they take it, and uh, learn from your children, and uh, perhaps uh, eventually, when you're spiritually ready, you'll turn on with your children if you think that's the right thing to do. The height of the American empire, where we had, for all intents and purposes, all the bombs, all the cops in the world, it was all ours. Uh, we had the two Cadillacs, the two car garages, the split-level ranch houses. Uh, we were number one, and there was no competition. At that particular moment, pushing that lifestyle of the status seekers, of the upward mobility, of what today are called yuppie, uh, style conscious, anxious, uh, desperate to always be uh, at the head of fashion, 
Well, enough people looked at that and said, eh, you know, they threw up. This is boring. This is spiritually unrewarding. It's unjust for all the other people that can't participate in it. And uh, so we don't want any of it. There must be something else. If there isn't anything else, we'll take death. Death is better than this vision. So uh, slowly, people started to question authority, be outraged about racism, to pay attention to other things.